Hey, it's your boy Chris, Players Pick Podcast. Here to shout out my sponsor, Road Roaster Coffee. Road Roaster Coffee makes an amazing array of light, medium, and dark roasts. My favorite is this kick ass right here. You can check out roadroastercoffee.com and use Players Pick as your coupon code for 20% off your very first order. Enjoy the pod. Players Pick Podcast. Picks and Perspective with Chris Johnson. Yes. Hey. All right. <laughs> I like your background. Uh, yeah. The the only thing, Chris, is uh, I don't know how stable this is. Okay. So give it um, a shot. See what happens. We'll give it a shot. And if anything, I would say if 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 it's funky and keeps cutting out, we'll you know maybe if you have another day this week. Maybe we could do it. You know. Sure. We could reschedule. We could do the something. Next day. Yeah. Tomorrow I'm a little booked, but I could do Friday. Um, yeah. 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 A, maybe okay. a little bit later than this if that would work for you i don't know yes. but yeah uh, it would let's see if this works it, let me know if it if it gets frustrating for you and we will redo it okay <laughs> cool so, sorry about that buddy it's like of all days you know yeah no that that's that anything that can go wrong kind of will go wrong right, right? like so it's kind of right, vibe yeah. and uh I'm familiar, man. Yeah. I've, I've I've set uh, side stage and watched uh, people go through all kinds of stuff at soundcheck, and he's like, "Oh, oh no, yeah. we're supposed to. It's only going to take thirty minutes to like do soundcheck. We'll be out of here. We'll go to lunch. We'll do a thing." And right. It's like, yeah. And then <laughs> two hours later, you're like, "Yeah, I know. Normally yeah. this thing isn't a problem, but the rack, it's like being exactly. weird today." <laughs> oh my god, we play we played our home. Sh- oh, oh, I just hurt my elbow. <laughs> <laughs> We played our hometown and uh, we played the Beacon in this in New York City and mm. you know it's my hometown show and like all this gear stuff like my wah pedal didn't work like it's stuff that never happens I'm like why of all shows but anyway <laughs> no it's uh, I understand and uh, no no problem so far so good so um, all right good yeah let's do it it seems like it's pretty stable yeah um well dude thank you so much for taking the time and this is episode number 101 for players pick nice. podcast i'm excited to have you on because i feel like uh especially for the number 101 i think about like uh, if i was going to get uh you know ultimate lessons on shred i'd want to come to you to jp <laughs> all right, right. Cool. like the, thinking about uh the rock discipline and all the things right. that i kind of grew up on and um and and just uh in general like uh you know, we, we knew each other a little bit through Jim Dunlop, you know, and yep. through our, our mutual friend, Frank Aresti, like, uh, you know, putting together a lot of the, the products that you have there at Jim Dunlop. And, um, and when I, when I kind of sat and thought about it, I was like, you know, uh, there are so there's a lot of great guitar players out there with signature picks, but I don't know anybody that's got four signature picks <laughs> <laughs> except for you. I know it's a little overkill, right? <laughs> No, it's cool. It's like it's it's yeah. on it's on par for your brand though too because um, there are a few people in the world that are able to as players, professional players that are able to not just like make one signature uh, product and then um, you make one signature product and then like kind of move on and then make another su- successful one and then make another right. successful one. And I think you kind of proved that with your guitars with Ernie Ball in a lot of ways. Like yeah. you solidified something that. Uh, prior to in a lot of ways i think and i think this is like a known fact or whatever the only other like signature guitar out there that that anybody will play is, that, is a les paul you know like right. like you know like that's like well, that's not a signature guitar you know it's like, right. i can, I can, I can play that but it is but yeah. it is and, yeah. and and the jp line has kind of become like that and i guess is only secondary to the les paul so you know yeah it's interesting i it, it's cool that it's sort of turned into that because it it means that the design sort of transcends, you know, just being associated with me, which is, you know, you know, I'm very grateful for, and it's awesome to have. And I, I love working with the engineers at Earning Ball Music Man. But, you know, if that guitar could, again, transcend just like being associated with me and what I do and be something that players of all different styles and genres enjoy just for the guitar, you know, never mind that it has my name on it, that's sort of secondary, then, then I think we really accomplished something design wise, you know, um, cause sometimes with signature instruments, it's hard 
you know, it's hard to get professionals to play them. They don't want somebody else's name on there. Or, you know, you might say, oh, this guy plays it and he's a certain style. So I couldn't possibly use that in what I do. Um, but the guitar has proved itself where people pick it up and they're like, you know what? This is an awesomely designed guitar, you know, with incredible quality. And, you know, it's just addictive as you start playing it. You know, you don't want to put it down. It sure is. No, it's incredible. Like that's uh, long before. Um, matter of fact, my good friend Ryan just bought a Blue Majesty. I mean, like he's got a bunch of solars and he's a Jackson guy kind of, yeah. but but like he was, he's just finishing his own uh, album and he was like, I'm going to reward myself. What am I going to get? And he's ah, like, nice. oh shit, I have to have a JP. I'd have to have a majesty. And he, he got some super, I don't know what the name of the blue is that you chose for that thing, but it's so cool looking. Like just really like shines and it's kind of like two-tone metallic or something. Yeah, and it's one of those things that, um, yeah, as you mentioned, like most people like, they're like, oh, um, you know, it's got somebody's name on it. Like, I'm not trying to like bring that into my thing and be known for sure. playing somebody else's name, but you, you know, that's transcended that. And in a lot of ways, uh, because of that kind of setting the standard, your other products, I feel like also tend to do well, you know, because like, oh, well, if it's JP, it's cool. Like he, I know he does the science with the people and right, right. The thing, you know, <laughs> so. well, that, that's actually, that's kind of what I'm going for. And it's really cool to make that association with, you know, if, 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 if something has my name on it, then somebody that, you know, maybe they never tried that thing, they're interested in getting a certain pick or a pedal, or whatever, they're going to say, well, I know that it's going to be a quality, you know, product. I know that the research went into it and I know it's going to be built incredibly like to my standards. So I, that's something I've been working on for a while to try to get that association. Um, and it, I, it's not accidental. It's, it, it takes hard work and it takes a lot of attention to detail, um, you know, to, to get gain people's trust that if they're going to try something they never tried before, they're kind of like, okay, I know, you know, to some degree, this is going to be a great product, whether I like it or not, I'm not sure yet. So that that's something that's really cool. And, uh, you know, I think part of the reason is, and I've said this a lot, the needs that I have as a guitar player and what I look for in guitars, amplifiers, pedals, picks, I don't think are too out of the ordinary, you know, uh, as far as what other players are looking for. They, they're sort of like pieces of gear that solve or address problems, you know, Mm. Um, and you fi you'll find like, you know, it's like a car. There's a great car designer and it's like, you sit in it and it's like, oh, it makes so much sense that this button is over here. Why would it be anywhere else? You know, um, things like that. And so because of like my sort of approach being almost like practical and very performance based, um, I think a lot of people relate to that and they say, oh, that's cool. You know, on the guitars, the, the bridge saddles are rounded. Like, okay, why didn't anybody ever think of that? Like, I don't want my hand to get cut when I put my hand, you know, right. they're just like sort of these problem solving things. And the, the pick thing is funny too, because, you know, I've been using uh, Dunlop Jazz 3s for forever and ever. And, uh, you know, the, the, the thought of trying to improve on that is kind of ridiculous. This is just the ultimate pick. But, you know, ever since the new materials came out, like the Altex and everything else, it did open up the door. It's like, oh, let's try it in all text. Let's try this. Um, and part of having four different picks, as you mentioned, part of that is trying to improve on something or discovering something else, being turned on to something and be like, hmm, I wonder if I could try this in a pick. And part of it is Frank Oresti's fault because he'll <laughs> like just like send me a picture. Oh, we're, we're trying this new thing. I'll send you some. <laughs> That's, yeah. kind of, that's kind of where the trinity words. pick came from yeah you know the um the flow pick that's andy james's fault because he came backstage one show and he's like i'll check this and it's like oh that's that's kind of cool it's also at the time i was getting into gypsy jazz and like thicker you know picks and a larger pick and everything kind of serendipitously made sense so the the end result is there are four picks that are just all in my opinion awesome and they're different tools to, to choose from, you know, it's like, 
I don't golf, but I know that golfers, when they're they're out there, choose different clubs for different things they have to do. So that's it's right. very similar to that. Yeah, different tools for different jobs. Different absolutely. You know, yeah, and they all sound down. right. They all feel great, sound great, perform great. Yeah. Now, do when you when you first started playing, and uh, what do you remember what your first couple of guitar picks were, or, or who inspired you to play what in the very beginning, or did you start off with jazz three? No, I didn't start off with jazz three. In fact, I didn't really think too much about a guitar pick when I first started. You know, it's not where I was just trying to be able to play a a bar chord. You know, I, I still remember like it's yesterday not being able to do that. Just like, <laughs> oh, it hurts. Like, how do you do this? <laughs> Yeah, it still it still hurts me actually. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I didn't really pay much attention to what I was using um, until I I started to get more into the you know the technical aspects of guitar playing and wanting to play better. And then you start to research. Well, what does this person use? What does that person use? You know, um, I remember watching a, a Michelangelo. Uh, instructional video and he was like the jazz three and i'm like well this guy plays a million notes you know per second let yeah. me try a jazz three <laughs> <laughs> you know and then you have that like aha moment you know what was i thinking before with my stupid uh you know i know that vibe i mean pick <laughs> my my good friend zane williams uh who i worked with at ampeg and mackie years and years mm -hmm. ago he did that thing to me where we worked next to each other and was just like, you still playing those like big, like classic Tortex things, the green right. ones. I'm like, yeah, man, Dimebag played them. Yeah. Chuck Schuldner from Death played them. I mean, what else do you need? You know, yeah, what he's else? Like, yeah, exactly. He's like, hand me this little red pick, this little nylon jazz. And I'm like, right. You got to be kidding. He's like, I'm just telling you, just go home for the weekend. It was like a Friday. He said, just play, yeah. the, only play this for the, for the weekend. Yeah. And then let's talk on Monday. And I'm like, all right. Yeah. And then I came back and I'm like, bro, I hate that you gave this thing to me because right. now I don't want everything else feels clunky and like. Exactly. <laughs> like what? It, it totally changes. The funny thing about picks too, I mean, there are certainly some picks out there that just, you know, for whatever reason you might not feel comfortable with. But sure. the, the funny thing about a guitar pick is that you can get pretty comfortable if you play with it long enough. If you're, if you sit there for like five to 10 minutes with a certain pick, you can vibe on it and get and get comfortable with it. I kind of have found that, you know. So it's just a matter of like, what are you really looking for? You know, for me, it was always um, accuracy, um, response time, and like the ability to glide off the strings really, really easily. And so all the picks that I have, like in my my signature Dunlop picks, are all they'll deliver that, and you know, just varying degrees. Um, some of that has to do with the the edge and the bevel of the pick. Some of it has to do with the material. Also, grip is a very personalized thing I found. You know, some people really like when there's like a a really strong sandpapery big grip, and some people don't like that at all. You know, I'm kind of like a subtle grip guy. I don't like if it's too raised. So there's all different things. Yeah, I was going to ask you about. So the first, the first uh, pick, the, the the JP Shield pick that you did. There you go. Yes. With the with the gloss tip here. Yes. What was the inspiration? Because the because the the pick is a little bit bigger than a regular Jazz Three. It is. Yeah. And it's got the raised JP Shield, so that that speaks to your subtle grip. That acts for the yeah, as the grip, and that that amount that it's raised is very in, it's very specific and important because yeah. it's either going to be something. You don't want it to be distracting, like, oh, I don't like the way this feels. You just want it to feel right. Yeah. And so um, did you come up with the gloss tip or was that something that was suggested to you or something? You I think it was suggested. Yeah. I mean, I, I was interested in doing like a fully gloss um, pick, a little bit larger size. You know, th this is like most guitar players I know have a drawer or crate filled with guitar picks of various, you know, you just like, Oh, let me try this. Let me try that. There you go. Or a bowl, <laughs> yeah. a bowl of it. <laughs> so, me. you know, it's like, I'm always trying different things, even though, you know, I use a certain thing. It's like somebody will go, Oh bro, you gotta try this. Just like your friend did, you know? Yeah. And you'll try it for a second. And, and one of the things I started kind of, you know, becoming interested in, especially since when they introduced the Altex was like a harder material than the nylon. 
Mm -hmm. um, and trying to hone in a little bit more on like accuracy. So with the tip um, and, you know, maybe a little bit larger size, like uh, it's, it's all experimental. Like, I wonder what that would feel like, you know, because maybe I tried a certain pick that was slightly bigger and I was like, well, this doesn't feel that bad. You know, let's see what would happen if I try to pick that size. But I don't remember. I think that was something that Dunlop came up with as far as, you know, glossing part of the, the pick. I don't remember the origin of how that came to be, but I, I thought it was a really very unique and cool design to, to do it that way. It still you know, is. And, and yeah. Uh, yeah. And as you said, you know, it, it, the raised shield acts as your grip. It has like the, the sharp point. Um, also at the time too, I just reminded myself, you know, Dunlop was coming out with all different types of picks, you know, sharps and different things. And they're, you know, again, Frank sending me all this stuff. And mm -hmm. <laughs> so you try it and you're like, wow, I never thought of something like this. Or, you know, the Jazz 3 has always been like, I don't know, 1.3 something millimeter pick. Like, and then you try a two milli millimeter pick, you're like, this is kind of cool. <laughs> you know, let me try this. So those subtle changes and experimenting, uh, you know, for me, that led to that first JP pick. That's cool. Um, it's a great, great pick. It's awesome. That thing is a, a machine. And then you kind of like, you fell back into Jazz 3 for a bit right. and, and ended up creating the, the NYC Jazz 3 prime tone. Right, exactly. It's and again, tough. another product that Dunlop came, you know, oh, they're, they're offering like a, a kind of different bevel, like a like an angled bevel. Asymmetrical bevel, yeah. There you go. And I was like, well, that's a really cool idea. Um, and, and I started playing with those. Again, I got sent them. I'm like, wow, I could play better with this, you know. And then my thought was like, well, what if it was really, there you go. Yeah. It's... What if it was truly personalized where the bevel was actually my bevel, like so the, yeah. the story behind that was um, I, I got like a, a uh, Altex Jazz 3 and just played it on tour for two weeks or, or more. Every time I would finish the show, I'd put it in my pocket religiously, keep it. Um, and eventually after a couple of weeks, it wore its own bevel. And uh, I, I'll never forget, I was in an airport going through the... Uh, you know, the security. And I, I thought I lost it for a second. Oh. I like left it on the belt or something. I was like, where's my pick? You know, because I was holding on to this thing, like, like he's protecting it, you know. It's the, most, um, it's the but, hardest thing to, to ask a guitarist to do is to like, hey, don't lose this pick for like yeah. two weeks. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So eventually, even though the Altex is a, um, is a very hard material, it uh, from playing that much on it, it wore its own bevel. And then that's what we... Then they matched that, you know, casted that, and made that the bevel on my prime tone, and I thought that was that was really cool. And I had tried some other picks that had like a asymmetrical bevel, and I thought it was a cool idea because it's like, well, when a guitar player plays, you know, they angle their pick a certain way depending on on them and what they like, and so the pick will tend to wear that way. Um, how cool would it be to have your own, you know, your, your broken, own angle? It's much your like own broken you know, Petrucci pick. Yeah. yeah, I mean, think about a guitar neck, right? You know, people like are, are so guitar players are really specific and picky about guitar necks. Some like them, mm. you know, the certain way a V or a U or C. Some like them fat, thin, um, and and some like them asymmetrical, where it's worn to your hand. You know, the first JP um, Ernie Ball Music Band guitars were like that. The necks were asymmetrical, oh, kind of like the Van Halen ones. Yeah. Oh, so. Um, you know, if you think about it, like, why shouldn't a pick have that, that same thing? So that was the whole, the whole idea with the prime tone, the NYC prime tone. I love that one uh, because it's like a cousin to the, 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 the standard jazz three prime tone, which has the grip on it, the like more aggressive grip. Yes. And it has a slightly different asymmetrical bevel that kind of falls in line with the rest of the line. But this one is obviously unique to you. Exactly. And again, that NYC is acting as the grip, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. You know, we've tried different things. This is all the different grip styles, you know, that that they uh, that they put out. And to me, having a raised, you know, some sort of raised writing on the pick, it feels the most comfortable. And, and so, and I know that you've told the story and you already kind of, uh, you know, uh, like hinted at it, that Andy James is the reason 
you know, yeah. for, for the flow. The flow. Yeah. But man, I have to tell you, I was there for that moment because I I was the one going through all these picks with pick styles with Andy for like, I mean, longer than we could even talk about. Like, nice. was like oh, mate, can you send me one of these? Yeah, I'll send you one yeah. of these. Oh, like, oh, you know what? Put my name on one of those. Okay, buddy. And then soon, by the time the, the picks would make it there with his name on it, he's like, actually, I really like these. Could you put, oh, right, what yeah. about these? And I'm like, okay, well, uh, I'm going to relate to it. I'm going to slow the roll here. I'm not going to put your name on this one. I'm going <laughs> right. to send it out until we know. It, until we know. Yeah. And then it was, it was like the third or fourth thing that we had done. And he says, hey, what about those old Jazz Tone 208s? Like, I used to play the shit out of those, but, uh, but they don't make them in Altex and they wear down too fast. And I was like, oh, we'll make, we'll make you some in Altex. How about that? I'm not putting your name on it yeah. first. And I'm like, he's like, no, no, put my name on it. I know I'd like those picks. Okay. Oh, okay. that's funny. So then he went out and saw you and said, oh, you know, try these out. And then, and then you, you were like, can I get more, you know? And, yeah, uh, <laughs> totally. I love them. But again, you know, so different than what I was used to. It's a larger, right. you know, it's more of a traditional pick size and it's two mil. I don't know what his were, but uh, mine two ended mil. up being two mil. Yeah. yeah. So it's different, but something about that, that thickness and that size and everything just kind of just i don't know it's also the tone it's a very specific very glassy chirpy kind of tone that you get okay. um the dream theater record uh distance over time that that came out a few years ago that was the pick that i used to write and record that album and i feel like you can hear it like on there you know yeah um really really cool of course we personalized mine with the majesty logo and everything and the interesting thing about that pick for some reason it doesn't have a raised grip, but I'm ask you about that. Why didn't we do that? Yeah, I don't know why it has. It has like a foil kind of uh, uh, hologramish uh, image on it. You know, my signature and then the Majesty logo. And for some reason, because of the way those picks are tumbled or something, it it the grip is fine. You know, it doesn't need a grip. And also, the other thing about that is since it's a thicker two mil. You know, now you're going to add more size if you have like raised lettering. So it, for some weird reason, that pick doesn't need a grip. It just stays in your hand and it feels great, you know? Agreed. I, I mean, I like the yeah. ones that we end up making with the grip in this vein too. But gotcha. uh, but 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 yours and Andy's both don't have grips. And you guys are the ones that reason why we started that whole line. And, right. uh, and I, I'm sure you know through Frank, but I mean, it's it's uh the flow line of picks was like the most successful new pick line that Dunlop had done in, wow. a, in ages and Amazing. It, you know, both based on you and Andy coming out and saying, Hey, check it out. This pick, this shape and everything is amazing. And then offering it in different gauges and different flavors with and without the, the grip and stuff. I still, to this day, um, I, I interview a lot of different people about picks and I'm like, Hey, what are you playing? Oh, I'm on the flow, man. I'm a 73 with the grip or I'm like, and now yeah. oh, no, I'm a Tortex flow guy. That's I'm like, I'm like, Oh, so it's like, and then, and then not too long after that came out, James Hetfield from Metallica was like, what's this flow pick thing? I need to try oh, that shit out. <laughs> yeah. So we ended up making it's him just... a special pick that was based right. off of the one that you and it. Yeah crazy well the interesting thing about that pick too is it, it kind of breaks the rules you know everything that we talked about you know the two picks leading up to that you know it was all about the edge the sharp edge you know the specific bevel on the prime tone the grip the size now this kind of breaks the mold now you have like not really a sharp edge you kind of have rounded edges and it's a two mil and it has no grip so why does it work and it just does and just it glides off the strings again you know part of my inspiration i picked up a gypsy jazz guitar i started getting into that and like those guys are all about like the thick hard picks you know that yeah and in fact uh frank sent me like bags of all these different giant four mil and you know crazy <laughs> picks i was like trying and uh yeah it that one just it works and and again um major difference in the tone of the pick i think because of the size of it and the fact that it's uh you know the the edges are, are it, it's kind of beveled all around but it's sort of like more rounded it has a it glides off the strings a little differently i think so, i yeah I, I think that the part for me the way i try to explain it to people is like the the 
the geometry of the tip is fatter and wider, you know, right. going, leading up to the tip than, than on any normal other pick for the most part. Yeah. So there's something about that, that when you choke up on it, that it kind yep. of acts as a bit of a depth gauge, right? It, it doesn't does. allow you to sink into the strings too far. Yeah. And as you're moving across the strings this way, I, I feel like it's, there's a, a certain amount of like security. I know it's a weird word to use, but it's no, I, you're totally right. I know exactly what you mean. So and, I, and also well, the cool thing about that pick that actually kind of goes into the, the, the latest one, the Trinity is the way that the edges of that flow pick, um, you have like a larger curved area mm -hmm. um, on the sides than, than like a, a regular jazz three or the, the prime tone would be. Uh, even the my original pick, which it comes more to a point, because there's like more of a curve if you show that flow there, um, there's a little trick that you can do. You know, if you hold the pick, which is what I do more on the side of your index finger, like not not between your fingers like this, but like you're doing on the side, and you angle your your hand down as you're you know approaching the strings. I like it. Actually, that rounded larger rounded edge releases off the strings even faster mm. um, and there's more of that surface on the pick so that was an interesting thing that i found with that one so that um, came, that ended up translating to kind of talking to frank and dunlop to create this kind of flow trot tr like like a tri flow I, yeah i call it like what i've been called yeah. Uh, Trinity, the Trinity, right? So it's yeah, like three, exactly. three flow tips that are like this wider angled, right? Wider beveled. So no matter which way you pick it up, it's it's the same. It's always the same. So it has that same thing that we're talking about, where it, it there's there's more of a curved surface area on the edge that you can play with to glide off the string. But there's three tips that are the same. So it doesn't matter how you pick up the pick. You know, you're going to be in the right position. It's also, um, it's, it's thinner because that's one of the things I kind of go back and forth. It's like, sometimes I really dig the two mil and then I'll go back to the jazz room. Like, oh, I like the thinner. <laughs> so this is like a, it's like a three-sided thinner flow, you know, and, pick. and again, Frank's fault. Cause he sent me pictures <laughs> of some experiments and I'm like, that looks really cool. And I fell in love with that, that shape. That's um, cool. And that lately has been my my go to. That's what I've been using. You're still on it. You know, I'm still on it. I'm still okay. loving it. And it's just, uh, man, you could you could be accurate. You could be precise. You can play fast. It has a great tone uh, because of the little larger shape. You could instead of choking up on it, you can actually pull back, and it's, it makes it really good for strumming and bigger mm. chordal things, which sometimes it's hard to get like on a little jazz three, you don't really have that, right. that vibe. So a little bit larger shape and those kind of those bellied out edges makes it so I can go from like doing like a shred thing to something that's more subtle to strumming chords to like, you know, really digging in. So it has a little bit more versatility. I so, think. so I'm, this is just a suggestion, you know, yeah. for, for, for pick number five. Yeah. <laughs> if, uh, I don't know. I'm thinking, I mean, this is my preference though. It's like when I've got this pick, I'm like, I do like it. I have ultimately started to make friends with it, but I still, I'm still just on the flow shape and that, and that, gotcha. that thicker thing. I was really hoping that there would be another size that like, maybe you could turn this into a try, like a 2.0, gotcha. you know, like right. something a little thicker. Cause well, I am the funny used to thing that. about you saying that is, uh, um, you know, one, the funny thing about you saying that is one of the things that we've been talking about is, you know, again, it's all experimenting and it's all finding what you like from one pick. Like you just said, you like the size, but if it had this other shape. One of the things that we haven't really done is, you know, a, a jazz three size, let's say, but in like a two mil right. um, pick. Now they... They do make a two mil jazz three, but it's, and I played that for a long time, actually. In fact, Frank Oresti remembers me turning him onto that pick. That is a cool pick, actually. It is a cool it's, pick. It's we, different, we, though. It's no, it's different. different. So, we, yeah, we were playing a show together, Bates Warning and Dream Theater was a, 
festival in Greece and I was all about those two mil jazz threes. And I was like, check this out. <laughs> and, and so he remembers that. But the thing about that pick is that it's, it's sort of bellied where it's like thicker yeah. in the middle and then it kind of tapers down. So that feels unusual, you know, if you're used to just like a flat pick. It's bellied so, and it's a little bit of textured on it for some reason. They try yeah, to the, do some sort right. of texture. The lettering is raised in a way that's like not not as comfortable. Yeah, it's not my favorite. Um, yeah, but, but a, a non-bellied two mil jazz three or you know, with, a non-bellied a, a non-bellied 2.0 flow jazz size like so right. I, I imagine right. that, that that size of the jazz but to be yes you know still have that wider bevel yes or the wider exactly. approach yeah you're you're thinking the way i'm thinking now so so you see how addictive it gets and <laughs> oh you my see God. you know it, it the, the the crazy thing for me and something that i'm always so grateful for is to be able to have the ability to work with Dunlop and, you know, have an idea, have a design idea um, that stems out of performance and wanting to be a better player, wanting, wanting to have a better experience playing, and then being able to see that through with engineers to an actual product. Um, you know, I, I'm really humbled and grateful to be able to do that. It's, it's an amazing thing because it's like, I have a passion for playing guitar and music, but I also have a passion for design and trying to solve problems. And so it's great to be able to work with a company like Dunlop and do that. You know, it's not, it's not every day you're able to do that. So hey, it's really cool. It's good to be king. It's good to be <laughs> king. <laughs> hey, I, well, I, I, I agree. And I appreciate that um, the way that you approached it all. I, I wonder like in the beginning, when you first started collaborating with companies, mm -hmm. Did you kind of set out for this type of world domination or was it just like <laughs> it was just a byproduct of being who you are trying to achieve what you're trying to achieve because of your goals? Was it? Well, yeah, I mean, I, you know, to me, you know, I, I it was hard to see into the future, of course, but it was it was always more of like almost discovering something about yourself that, you know, things like design um and having ideas and, and asking questions you know why can't we do this like why why does this amp only have one eq on it i want two can we have two <laughs> like you know they, and and then realizing that when you actually make those things come true they make a lot of sense and and they solve issues and they solve problems um, and then you be you start to realize like well i really like this i really like doing this you know this is another passion as well um and, and so it didn't start out that way it, it i was always curious and i was always like why does this have to be you know i'd play a guitar and I'm like, why is the volume knob so close to my pinky i keep ah. hitting into it um things like that you know but but to get to a point eventually where i was able to implement those things on a regular basis and work with such amazing companies i mean ernie ball music man for the past 20 years um dunlop demarzio mm -hmm. mesa boogie and and work in tandem with them and their all their talented engineers to say to ask questions and be like what if this was like this what if we tried and and some of the it, some of it gets ridiculous you know <laughs> trying different fret wire and material and sizes and things you know it's it gets insane and it's funny because the people you're working with have the same thing. So you're like, you know, talking about the nerdiest things and trying all these different things and prototypes are flying back and forth. Um, but it, but fortunately it did turn into something where the things that we ended up coming up with, in, including even like the wah pedal, the JP 95 mm -hmm. ended up being really amazing pieces of gear that other people are enjoying. So then you see the you start to see like the benefit like well this is cool like I love playing guitar I love music I love designing things and we're coming up with stuff that other people really love and you'll get feedback like man that's the best wah pedal ever <laughs> like you know it's like that's how cool is that you know that's so you feel like you're somehow contributing to the enjoyment of uh, <laughs> other guitar players which is, Absolutely. Which is a lot of fun so yeah, yeah. so i didn't yeah I, I didn't 
foresee back then what it would turn into. But I certainly discovered along the way that it was something I was really, really into. It wasn't it, it wasn't secondary or passive. It was something I was like very actively into. Makes it makes sense to me because when I think about uh, your music and the legacy kind of of dream theater and stuff, like it, a lot of what progressive music and the type of things that you guys get into, you take regular music, like, and you expand upon all the things that you found interesting in music. It's like. Uh, oh yeah, we we love heavy rock, metal, grooving, you know, odd time syncopation, but we also like mess around with swing and blues and like uh, Pink Floyd and like right. it, and all these cool like kind of classic things. And we don't feel like we have to s- stick with any one of them. And you kind of like you, it, you've created its own. You've helped uh, embellish upon and create you know further this class right. of music, right? Right. And so so it, it makes sense that the tools that you use have to kind of expand with that at some point. Right, exactly. Right? It's it's kind of like, you know, you're bringing up a good point. It's it's, it's very much the same type of mentality uh, and, and approach, you know, um, because it it's, sorry, this thing is like falling out. Um, you know, it part of it is like with music and, and the different sides of, you know, what, what it means to be in a band and to create music and produce records and, you know, work on uh, artwork with artists and work on the live set design with, you know, designers and everything, it all, and designing guitars and picks and everything. It's, it's all like a very similar mindset where, you know, there's a very, a, a very like, uh, creative side of you that just kind of like ignited, you know, where you look at those situations as new opportunities to do something cool, do something different, try to be better at what you do. Again, ask questions, break rules. Why can't we do this? <laughs> oh, let's, you know. And so it, it all crosses over. And the funny thing is, too, you know, as time has gone by, I've gone into other areas. Um, that are not music related, hmm. you know, like having um, a, a, a signature uh, bourbon or or a right. beard line, you know, beard products and stuff, um, which all sounds kind of funny. But the thing is, when you start, when you work with these different people, you realize you all have this common attitude where it's like everyone into what they do. Everyone's into the art, the science, and you know, uh, the craftsmanship of what what you do. And you find like this, you know, there's there's nothing to that that's different about distilling an amazing 120 proof bourbon, you know, and paying attention to all the details and all the chemistry and science and artistry and that goes into that with building like the ultimate guitar you know when you speak to the different engineers it's like the same person they're just in a different field you know Mm. um and it carries over to to making a record and how you produce it and the people you work with you know i'm talking to andy sneep who mixed the latest dream theater record we love andy did such an awesome job mixed my solo album as well it's same mentality you know the guy is just like into what he does asks questions doesn't stop until it's right you know it's like so so that that headspace of like being really passionate being creative pushing yourself wanting to do better every time it it goes across the board and also there's like um a very a a large amount of attention paid to the art side of it which Mm -hmm. i love you know and that art just specifically mean the art if you're dealing with an artist or if you're dealing with a designer or a visual designer but it's also just in your approach to it you know the art being the music the art being the mix the art being the bourbon or the art being the scent of the what you're creating <laughs> it's like and people and it's there is a common type of, of like personality type you know that that really like hold that very close you know that that sort of attention to letting the art shine through. And if you do things in a certain way, and I talk about this with Sterling Ball a lot, you know, it's like, don't 
worry of it. Is it going to sell? Are people going to like it? You know, mm. you don't think about music that way either, you know, unless you're specifically trying to write a hit pop song. Maybe you do think that way. But, you know, if you're just coming from it, from like an art that you're trying to express yourself in the truest way, or you're trying to make a guitar that's like the most comfortable to me, you know, Sterling would say like, don't worry about the marketability of it or if it's going to sell if you if you're true to it and you answer all those questions and follow through and you believe in it a hundred million percent then it's going to be successful you know and so i find all the people in all these different industries have that same mindset i love that you you know frame all of that in your in a way that when you go to make a new guitar a new product or a new album that you're not looking for the commercial success out of the box. That's not, that shouldn't be a part of the equation. You should try to make the right. thing as good or as artistic, as interesting as possible for the sake of doing that and, and be, you know, behind it a, a thousand million percent and let that be uh, the thing that sells it because that's what I feel like has happened with the band. It's like, you didn't obviously, if you were trying to make music that was appealing to the masses, you wouldn't be doing the thing you're doing. Right. 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 Exactly. Exactly. I would have chose a different style. <laughs> yeah. You know, and the, the biggest thing when making, making new music and putting out new records, it's like, I always kind of use this barometer. Like, am I unbelievably psyched to show it to people? Like, to, mm. you know, so proud of it. Like, man, you got to hear this. You got, I want to put this on for you. And it's like, if the answer is yes, then it's a success. If the answer is not quite, then you're not there yet, you know? Mm. Um, and, and I feel like that with with all of these things, you know, whether it's the pedal or the pick, uh, the guitar, it's like, I feel confident. Or whether you like dream theater music or not, or whether you like the art that's associated with it or not, I feel like you got to check this out. Like, I feel so pumped about it. and. And that sort of um, enthusiasm comes from knowing that you did everything that you could possibly do to make it the best that you could, you know, mm. you could release. And you put the time in, you ask the questions and you, you know, said no a million times and yes here. And like, why can't we do this? And this could be better. And, you know, again, all the people that that have success like that have that similar mindset. You know, we did something recently. I came out with my first plug-in um, with Neural DSP, the uh, Archetype Petrucci. So awesome. it, was, it was different for me because I never, you know, really got involved with um, guitar plugins. You know, I've always been a full-on amp guy, and I still am. Um, but, you know, when Neural came along and, and uh, we decided to partner, it was, I know I knew I was getting into a world that I was not expert at you know sure so it was a matter of like okay if we're gonna do this and i'm gonna be bold enough to put my name on it i gotta make sure that it's like you know, there's a whole different world of of players and people that are into this that know it way better than me so we did we put the time in and did the research and asked the extra questions and you made you know when it ended up being like the the most um uh, what's the word comprehensive you know guitar plug-in archetype to date that they did and I, I remember feeling feeling nervous when it was launched almost like a record's being launched oh really and the the, the first thing was like the reaction was so positive like people were like this is the best one yet you know and it i i had kind of felt this feeling of relief like okay i'm getting involved in a in a different area um, of, of the music industry, but I'm applying the same things that I've learned That's that it. have made these other things successful. So hopefully with that formula, again, your name is associated with it. People will say, well, all right, if his name's on it, I'm going to try it because it's probably going to be good. And then they could take it from there and then have it be successful because we did all the extra work and because I pushed them and they pushed me and we didn't stop until it was as good as it could be. So, mm. you know, again, it's a, just, an, sorry, these earbuds keep popping <laughs> up. Um, it's just another area that, that involved 
very similar aspects, you know, right. Pay, paying attention, focusing on the art, you know, not being making us be that this is the best thing that we could do together that I am unbelievably proud of that I will use a hundred percent and not worried too much about you, what kind of success is this going to have? You know, I mean, you hope for success, but you're not trying to do things to appeal to other people. You're trying to make something that's the best thing you could possibly make. But I, I, the, the successes are great to praise. I love seeing that because most of what your story is, is full of success. I'm wondering about, um, is there an album? Is there a song? Is there a project where you look back in retrospect and like, not my favorite thing, not my favorite thing. There's stuff like that, of course, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, people will say this, it's the failures are what make the successes more, you know, enjoyable and what lead to them, you know, because you're, you're, you're learning lessons along the way uh, of what to do and what to not do and what can be done better. Um, you know, sometimes it might be a mix on a, on a song. It might be an artwork. It might be the arrangement. Oh, we really shouldn't have done this this way. This kind of went on a little too long or, or whatever. Um, and that stuff is, but it's like, it's also part of the story, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's all, yeah. It's also the part of ultimately what, what your makeup is going to be. So it's, it's okay. That type of stuff is okay. The failures are okay as well. You know, do you, do you have a least favorite dream theater album? <laughs> a least favorite dream theater album. I don't think I do. I think that would be a weird thing to say. <laughs> Oh man! So you so you, you hold them all in the same level. They're all ex equally as bad. I think as that's I think that some are better than others. Um, I I think that you know the funny thing is that you you sometimes you look back at, at some of the stuff you did when you were really young. You know, when I think about the first string theater record and like when we wrote that and how old we were and like our first time in the studio, you're kind of like, Oh, <laughs> you know, this is going to be a little bit better. You know? So if, you, so if I had to, you know, go back to, to uh, the first one and be like, Oh, maybe that could be remixed or maybe I could have done that better or, or whatever. But you know what, again, it's like, it's all part of the history of the band. It's all, you know, albums for a band that really, they kind of like, in, encapsulate the, whatever time period that was for you and what you were going through in your life and how old you were, you know, and everything. So they're all, they're all incredibly meaningful. So, um, a, you know, this sounds answer. cliche. Yeah. I've, I've heard people say, you know, before oh, they like your kids and it's kind of true. Like you can't pick a favorite, you know? <laughs> yeah. But, well, it's okay. You don't have to say it out loud, man. It's all right. You can keep it to yourself. I'm, John, I'm, you know, one of the things that I love, um, and I'll just say a little quick thing is that like you're such a personable guy for, for being so for so uh, well achieved and and such a you know phenomenon in the guitar world like you in a lot of ways. I think that I mean, I look at when I first found you like around, uh, I guess it was Images and Words, Pull Me Under was on the radio. Yeah, right. Everybody was like, oh, is that Queensryche? And I'm like, right. yeah. I'm like, no, dude, that's a band called Dream Theater. They're sick, yeah. you know, and like and I was the always the one like, isn't that, you know, I was like, Queensryche isn't this good. Like, I don't I, like that was me. <laughs> that was me. Young me going. Well, yeah. How, how could you think this was Queensryche? How, I don't understand. No, that's so funny. I was defending like I was like, why? You know, um, and then Awake came out and my buddy Ryan Miranda and I, um, we were it was 94. We were like 16 going on 17. We, we drove uh, from up here in Northern California down to the Bay Area to see you guys uh, at cool. the Warfield. It was yeah, like December 1st, 1994. Uh, Fate's Warning was opening. Um, I don't think I don't think Frank was in the band at the time for some reason or not. Okay. I, don't, I don't know. I, I think I asked him about that. He was like, ah, oh, I was doing something else, I think. But right, right. Um, you and uh, we, me and my buddy Ryan, we 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 popped out after uh, the show and we're hanging out around that back door there at the Warfield, yeah. you know, by the in a the lovely buses. neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, an amazing neighborhood. <laughs> you see all kinds of incredible things go down there. Yes. Um, yeah. But you you and uh, Mike Portnoy stopped and talked to us, and uh, we we were we were just like so enamored because, like again, we were young and just earlier that year, um, I had 
convince my buddy to come up to Portland. I, I was living in Portland for a, a, a summer. Yeah. And we, we, we saw Pantera together and ended up getting backstage oh, with nice. Dimebag and everybody. And it was like the greatest thing ever. It was my first big concert. And then like less than six months later, I had moved back to California and we w- went down and we met you and Mike. And we were just like, dude, we, we're the luckiest people on the planet. Oh, that's and awesome. Because because both of both times we met our heroes, they were cool. They were nice that's so to cool. us. That's so cool. You know? That's awesome. Yeah. So That's a great story. That's awesome. It makes me, it makes like my heart, you know, swell thinking about like, oh, well, when somebody is so good at what they do and they have achieved such great success. And even at that time, I mean, you've done a million things since then right but, right <laughs> but when i when interact with you when i see you you're like you're always so calm and cool and i'm just like man does does petrucci ever get mad it's like what what, ups, <laughs> what 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 upsets this guy does anything upset this guy how does he keep yeah. his calm you don't want to see me when i'm mad tell me about that what's that like <laughs> <laughs> well you know what first of all i i think that you know obviously we all get mad <laughs> So, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, when, when I was uh, growing up in a similar way, um, I had, I had bands that I was just, you know, me and, and John, my young, were just like, so into like Iron Maiden and Rush and stuff like that. And, um, and I would see, you know, not, not that I ended up meeting those guys at, at an early age, but, um, like when you interacted with us and we were never, we weren't even on that level anyway, but. We were playing the war field, not the, uh, you know, not the arena. The candlestick, um, yeah. But I would see how they would interact with people. And it's like, man, people, like, they're always so humble and always so um, just giving and, you know, realize the importance of the relationship between people making music and people coming to the concerts and appreciating it. And it's like, there's always been this sort of like, I just, I just feel like I'm, you know, we're all part of the same thing. It doesn't matter. Like, mm. you know, just because you're on a stage and somebody you're, you're like higher <laughs> on, a, <laughs> on, on a platform and somebody's, not, you know, what does that mean? You know, <laughs> somebody's watching you play, like we're all, you know, just into music and whether we're playing it or going to see it, you know, I'm that guy that's in the audience looking up and, and loving it so it's like i think it's important to have that humility and i've had a similar experience where i've met people that i really looked up to and they were just the coolest people you know and i remember doing g3 and just Mm. playing with joe and steve and you know eric johnson and all these guys it's like one guy's nicer than the next it's like there's not (laughs) and there's no reason to not be that way you know, and of course you hear stories with certain artists here and there and, you know, everyone's different. But um, to me, having that sort of level head and and approach where it's like, you know what, I'm not going to think this makes me above anybody in any way, because that's just silly, you know, um, because it's also like you never know who you're talking to, you know, that there's so many unbelievable players and artists and musicians of all different ages and that you know you don't want to come off as you know you're, you're talking like you're 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 the shit and meanwhile like this kid like you know blows circles around you like it's like it's like you know you got to realize it's like we're we all love music you know if we're talking guitar we're all we all love guitar and it's like i think it's important to have that sort of that humility i really do especially you know, in, in, in any sort of like entertainment industry, you got to watch that too. You know what I mean? Because you don't want to like, I don't know. It, it's, it's, you don't want to become disconnected and like detached that way. I don't think that's healthy, you know? I can appreciate um, that. So fortunately, an early age, which was good. <laughs> that's, that is good. Um, I wonder, can you hear me? I could hear you now. Okay. I, I actually. Uh, Do you got a roll? Edit the, uh, yeah, I just I I know it's a hundred million percent my fault with the stupid <laughs> Wi-Fi, but uh, 
you're muted all sorry, of a sudden. Sorry, it just like kicked me off. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're okay. So you got um, you, you got to take no, off. No, my sound check has started. <laughs> oh, got it. Hey man, no worries. Uh, I, maybe we can uh, do a part two sometime, um, and with better Absolutely. Wi-Fi when you're chilling at home or something. And well, I got a ton more questions, but uh, I guess. Um, yeah, I just want to say thanks so much for your time and and telling some stories and 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 relating about the guitar picks and your process and showing a bit of your humanity. Um, uh, thank you for being a humble uh, wizard of sorts that uh, <laughs> that bestows upon us interesting uh, magic tricks that we can try out ourselves. <laughs> That's really cool, man. Um, I'm a really a big fan of of how you hold yourself and how. Um, you spend your time with the rest of us. So awesome, man. I appreciate thing. that. Thank you so much, Chris. It, it's great. I, I love talking about this stuff and I love the stories you shared. It's awesome. Thanks again. Very, man. Very cool. Have a great show tonight and I'll talk to you real soon. Okay. All right. Thanks, buddy. All right. Talk soon. Players Pick Podcast Picks and Perspective with Chris Johnson. Players Pick Podcast is brought to you in part by our good friends at Dunlop Guitar Products, Kiesel Custom Guitars, and our favorite new coffee company, Road Roaster Coffee. Use coupon code PLAYERSPICK for 20% off your first order at roadroastercoffee.com.